right, everybody, we are going to continue with our next session. And our speaker is Mark Corbett. Mark is pastor of Severn. Am I saying that correctly? I hope. Severn Baptist Church in Severn, North Carolina. He has an MDiv in ministry leadership from Columbia International uh, University. He's lived with his family abroad for 14, he lived with his family abroad for 14 years, including Indonesia, uh, where he taught at a Bible college. So missions guy, I love that. Um, he's contributor to Rethinking Hell's blogs and podcast and YouTube channel. And uh, I've only known Mark for just a very, very little while, but here's what struck me the most about him. He, can, you, he really is one of those guys that as soon as you meet him, you can tell he loves the Lord. And I mean that very sincerely. I was like, this is, this is a marker of who Mark is. So I, I'm delighted to hear from someone like that, and so you should be as well. So let's give a round of applause for Mark Corbett, everybody. Okay, great. And uh, so uh, can we go ahead and uh, switch the uh, slides to my computer? Oh, okay. Uh, uh, that's fine. Well, we will go ahead and get started then. Well, before I jump into the material about hell, just a couple of introductory uh, issues. Um, I'm from Maryland in terms of where I'm originally from, where I grew up. Um, but I sound like I'm from someplace more interesting. Uh, so, so people hear my accent and often ask me, sometimes people think I'm from Europe, sometimes people think I'm from the Middle East, and I'm always sorry to disappoint people that I'm just from Maryland and my folks all just grew up in the United States. Why do I have an unusual accent? There's a number of factors, but the biggest one is that when I was a child, I had a speech impediment, and what's left over is an unusual accent, so I hope you're not disappointed. So uh, let's talk about some of these letters. Uh, ECT is an abbreviation we use that stands for Eternal Conscious Torment. It is also called the traditional view because lots of people have believed this view of hell for a long time. This traditional view is that the unsaved will be raised from the dead immortal to remain alive forever in their resurrected bodies confined to hell in some type of torment. So all Christians, I mean, you might find some weird exception, but pretty much all Christians believe that everybody who has ever lived, every human who has ever lived is going to be resurrected from the dead when Jesus comes back except for those who are still alive when he comes back. And, and if you're a Christian, you'll be instantly transformed. Um, so the, the, the question is, what happens to the people who, when they're resurrected from the dead, um, what happens to those people who never believed in Jesus and rejected the gospel? And uh, so that's, that's part of our topic. And the traditional view is that these people, they've been resurrected, now they have their, their resurrected bodies, and some people think it's literal fire. Some people think it's, 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 it's some kind of emotional suffering. But somehow, they'll be suffering in hell forever. And then there's CI. That's conditional immortality. It's the view that I hold. It's the view that Rethinking Hell uh, promotes and tries to explain. It is also called annihilationism. Uh, the conditional immortality view says that only those who meet a condition namely having faith in Jesus, will have eternal life. That's why it's called conditional immortality. Unbelievers will perish. They will not live forever anywhere. God will completely destroy uh, both their bodies and souls in hell. So these are the two views I will be discussing uh, in my presentation here. Um, now, in deciding which view is correct, what matters? What should we focus on? Well, we want to focus on the Bible. Uh, God's word is, is truth. So uh, people have feelings and people have opinions and there's human ideals and philosophies, but we believe that what God has revealed to us 
in the Bible should be the final word uh, when it addresses a topic, and it certainly does address the topic of what will happen to unbelievers, what will happen to the unrighteous at the final judgment. So we are going to be focusing on biblical evidence, and there's words, and there's verses, and there's broad Bible themes. Because we only have so much time tonight, I'm mostly going to talk about Bible verses. But at the end, I'll briefly mention some word studies, and I will briefly mention some broad Bible themes. That's another word for systematic theology, broad Bible themes. Okay, so God's word is truth. That's what we want to look at. Um, eternal conscious torment versus conditional immortality. And I'm going to be using this image of a set of scales to do two things at the same time. I'm going to share my own story, how I shifted from believing in eternal conscious torment, from thinking that the Bible taught eternal conscious torment, to believing that the Bible teaches conditional immortality. Now, at the same time that I'm telling my story, I'm going to be sharing a simple introductory level, uh, kind of a, a, a basic presentation of the biblical case for conditional immortality. So, when I'm an infant and a toddler, I don't know anything about hell, I don't have a view, and, uh, but then I get a little bit bigger, I'm in elementary school, and I thank God so much that I grew up in a family that believed in Jesus, believed in the Bible, me and my siblings were taken to church uh, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, and by God's grace, I heard the good news about Jesus dying for my sins. I believed it. I walked forward. I was saved. I was baptized. I also learned that, that how you know the truth about things like this is you look in the Bible. And whatever the Bible says, that's true. Although sometimes it's not simple to figure out exactly what the Bible is saying. Now, at this young age in elementary school, the, the main way I was getting this truth was by listening to teachers that I trusted. My own family and then uh, teachers in Sunday school, the pastor. In elementary school, I sat in church. I got a lot out of those sermons, even though I was drawing pictures of rockets in the side of the bulletin. It was getting into my little heart and mind and changing my beliefs. And, uh, and, and Royal Ambassadors, that was a kid's program that I was in, all of that stuff. Now, these trusted teachers, they were not absolutely perfect. Of course, at the time, I didn't have the skills to sort out all different views. Um, and one of the things they taught me was the eternal torment view of hell, which at the time, I just thought must be true because it's the same people who were teaching me all the other truths I learned. Well, I get older and I go to uh, high school, graduate, college, graduate, and during these years, um, I continue to believe in the eternal conscious torment view of hell, but something changes. I start to learn how to study the Bible for myself. Now, that does not mean that trusted teachers are out of the picture. To this day, I thank God for other Christians who teach me and, and help me to understand the Bible. But now, there's a list of Bible verses that at this point in my life, I believed showed that the Bible was teaching eternal torment. And also, starting in high school, I, I was studying the Bible myself, I was reading it. I even started teaching some little Bible studies myself and, and did the same thing in college and was sharing the gospel. And during this time, uh, I would include not a whole lot, it wasn't a big focus, but I would include, when it came up, the eternal torment view of hell based on some of these Bible verses. So, th so this became part of the reason I believed in eternal conscious torment. Now, uh, after college, I went in the Navy. I was blessed also to uh, get married to Hope. Unfortunately, she was not able to come to the conference with me. So if I seem a little hopeless, you'll understand, yeah, you'll understand why. 
Um, so, uh, but anyways, while, while I was in the Navy, the Lord called us into a different type of ministry. We were doing ministry, not professionally, but we were doing ministry in our church. And some Marines are too small to have a uh, chaplain. So um, somebody volunteers to lead a little short service on Sundays when the submarine's out to sea, and that was me. I was the Protestant lay leader. So I was doing uh, ministry, but the Lord called us to a different type of ministry, and so we went to seminary to get ready. So here I am at seminary studying a lot, and a good evangelical Bible-believing seminary, uh, and I was, I was blessed to go there, and as far as I know, all of my professors believed in eternal torment. And they gave me books to read. And some of the books talked about hell. And when they talked about hell, they all taught the view of eternal torment. Something happened then that my seminary did not intend and that I did not expect. I was assigned to uh, read a, a book. And it's a great book, a book by... Uh, John Piper, called Let the Nations Be Glad. Has anybody read it? Um, it's a, oh, somebody has. Great. It's a book about missions. And it's about 30 years old now, but uh, it's still very relevant. And I highly recommend it. If you, are not, if you are interested in missions, I highly recommend it. If you're not interested in missions, I highly recommend it because you need to get interested in missions, spreading the gospel to all nations, including especially unreached people groups. And that's what this book is about. But in this book, just a few pages of the whole book, three, four, five, I don't remember exactly, John Piper defends the eternal torment view of hell. Now, why would he put that in a book like this? Well, saving people from God's wrath is one of the motivations for missions. Is it the highest, most important motivation? Is it the only motivation? No, but it is one motivation. And to this day, I believe that saving people from God's wrath is one legitimate motivation for ministry and evangelism and going to the ends of the world with the gospel. But he wanted to defend his view of what God's wrath would look like um, at the final judgment, and he did that. But John Piper had a friend who's already been mentioned tonight, John Stott. And John Stott believed in annihilationism. So John Piper wrote in his book why his friend John Stott was wrong. But because they were such good friends, John Piper honored his friend, sent him the manuscript, and allowed him to give some feedback, which John Stott did, and John Piper included it in a footnote in the book, a big footnote. He uh, included this footnote, which had John Stott's response in John Stott's own words, saying why he thought that Piper wasn't fairly representing his view of annihilationism, and that annihilationism could be true. And I read that footnote, and I had been reading Piper's arguments, and the footnote made more sense to me than the arguments. And I started to think at that point that maybe, possibly, conditional immortality, which is also called annihilationism, might be true. And I thought very quickly uh, about some Bible verses that I hadn't thought about before, in relation to hell. So I thought about uh, some of these verses over here. And, um, and, and by the way, I know that it's hard for you to read those verse references. I'll, I'll, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about some of them, and I'll put them on the screen where you can read them in a few minutes. And I also th thought about the, the issue of justice. Not Mark Corbett's personal feelings, but what the Bible teaches about justice. And for me, the scale started to tilt, and they leaned a little bit towards thinking conditional immortality seems more likely. So we, we're going to look at some of the voices claimed for the eternal conscious torment side. But for now, let me just quickly, with only relatively short commentary, 
show you some of these voices for the conditional immortality side. One of the voices that came to mind very quickly at that time was Romans 6.23. I had memorized that voice for the purpose of sharing the gospel with people. I still use that voice for sharing the gospel with people. On the plane, uh, this would have been just yesterday, on the plane, I used this voice to share the gospel with the lady who was sitting next to me, Romans 6.23. Um, so it's a great voice for sharing the gospel. It also tells us something about the nature of final judgment. It says, um, eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now, if you're not used to thinking about conditional immortality, you might be missing it, but it's right there in front of you. Immortality is eternal life. That's what the two words mean the same thing. If you have eternal life, you're going to live forever. If you have immortality, you're going to live forever. Um, and there's a condition. You have to be in Christ Jesus our Lord, which we know from the Bible means you have to be in a relationship with Jesus as our Lord and Savior. If you're not in a relationship with Jesus as your Lord, you are not going to have eternal life. And if you don't have eternal life, you can't be in torment forever because you can't, a, a, a dead person can't be tormented. This is, this is just plain and simple conditional immortality. This verse also teaches the other side of conditional immortality. What happens to the people who um, are not in Christ Jesus our Lord? The wages of sin is death. And to me, I remember thinking, well, that does sound more like the annihilation teaching then it sounds like eternal torment. So I started to shift. Now some people say, well, hold on a minute. Uh, a, a lot of Christians think, at least right now in this world, when we die, that we don't completely die because our, our soul goes someplace. I, I, I happen to think that that view is, is, is correct. But um, at the final judgment, the same thing is going to happen to the body and the soul of unbelievers. So Matthew 10, 28, and do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. And again, to my mind, this sounded more like annihilationism. Then there's the most famous verse in the Bible, John 3, 16, was already mentioned earlier tonight. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him, that's a condition. You have to believe in Jesus to get what? Should not perish, but have eternal life. This is, what, once you see it, it's just, to me, it's just so obvious. This is conditional immortality. Once you, if, if you believe in him, you have eternal life. You have immortality. What happens if you do not believe in him? You perish. Now, if, I pray this would never be true for me or any of you, but if I had a friend or a family member, maybe a cousin, and they were captured by, uh, let's say, ISIS in some place like Syria, and somehow uh, our government knew that they were being held in a dungeon and tortured, I would not go around and tell people, my friend has perished. Would you, would you say that? But if my friend had been blown to smithereens, turned into ashes and smoke by a big IED, that's a big bomb, I would say, my friend has perished. So to me, John 3.16 just seems to shout conditional immortality and annihilationism. Second Peter 2.6, if by turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to ashes, he condemned them to extinction, making them an example of what is going to happen to the ungodly. So again, this just sounds to me like annihilation. What's going to happen? Just, just treat this verse. Don't treat it for just a minute. Don't treat it like an advanced theology issue. Treat it like a simple middle school reading comprehension question. According to Peter in this verse, what will happen to the ungodly? <laughs> they'll be torn to ashes, and they're going to go extinct. So to me, it sounds like annihilationism. 
Uh, it also rules out universalism. The evangelical form of universalism says that uh, unsaved people in hell will eventually realize they were wrong to reject the gospel, accept the gospel, believe in Jesus, and be allowed out of hell. Here's one big problem with that. Ashes cannot repent. Ashes cannot repent. Okay. Uh, Matthew 3, 12, his winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. And uh, this is a farming issue, uh, illustration, and the chaff is the part of the plant that you're not going to keep to, to cook and eat. Um, and when you put that plant into a fire, it very quickly gets burned up and its guard is turned into ashes and smoke. So uh, I was thinking about these forces and I started to tilt towards conditional immortality. But because I was focused on a number of other important things, I did not investigate this or study this deeply for a number of years. I just put this issue on the back burner and I think I was right to do so. God had me working on other things that were important. But then I was, some things prompted me to come back to this issue. And when I did come back to this issue, I quickly found that both sides have more voices that they claim for their side. And uh, so um, let's look at, let's add some more voices to the picture here. And uh, we'll add some more voices to both sides. On the left side, these are, I now have on the eternal conscious torment side pretty much all of the voices that uh, traditionalists uh, often cite to support their view. Um, now, if you look or you think, some, sometimes somebody will come up with some other voice that's not on this list. Usually when I look at those other voices, I'm like, I mean, it doesn't sound like it's remotely talking about this topic. But these are the main ones, and I know these are the main ones because I've read lots of books and had lots of discussions and arguments and debates, and the same voices come up over and over, of course. Um, all of the voices are from the uh, New Testament except for one, Daniel 12, 2, from the Old Testament on the eternal conscious torment side. Now, on the conditional immortality side, so far, I've added the voices from the Old Testament that support conditional immortality, but there are also more voices from the New Testament. Now, at this point, you're probably thinking, come on, Mark, all those voices don't support conditional immortality. The list isn't that unbalanced. Okay, I don't want you to take my word for, for it. Honestly, I don't. I, I, do your own research. This is what I did. Make your own list. Okay, let's, uh, let's talk about how you might might do that. Um, and of course, the difference in the number of voices caused the scales to shift for me. Now, how would you make your own list? Well, to, to begin with, just think of the voices you can think of or find the voices that you can find on your own. That's a good first step. After that, I recommend that you go, okay, I'm not totally objective, go to the awesome Rethinking Hell website which I have a little bit of material on there, but mostly other people in the Rethinking Hell ministry made the website. Uh, and under the Explore tab, they have lists, very similar to the list that I had on the uh, screen, of voices that people use to defend the eternal torment view and lists of voices that people use to defend the conditional immortality view. So just look and ask yourself this question. Just to begin with, if I held this view, can I see why someone would use this voice to defend it? And that's, that's, the, that's just the beginning of your list making. I'm not saying that's the whole, that's the whole story. And, uh, and, and see what, what li and I'm not the only person who have made, who's made lists like this. I know a number of other people who have been through this exercise, but we're not done yet. If you're an evangelical like me, and I suspect that maybe everyone uh, in this room, certainly most people, are, then you don't believe that there are actually voices in the Bible that teach contradictory truths. 
um, conditional immortality and eternal conscious torment, logically speaking, they can't both be true. Now, we can have people who believe those different views, who can be friends and minister together and worship together, but the truths, they, they can't both be true. And so what we want to do, because we believe that the Bible is God's word, and so it doesn't contradict itself. <clears throat> so I studied each verse, some in more depth than others, but uh, a lot of them in a lot of depth, and, and looked at the context, and I looked at arguments and counter-arguments about it, and, and to see uh, which view, if, if either, each verse actually supports. Now, I remember during this process hearing a claim from my friend Chris Date. He, he, he's sitting right over there. And at first, I thought he might be overstating the case for conditional immortality. This, isn't, this is a paraphrase, but he's right here, so he can, he can, he can tell you if it's not an accurate paraphrase. He said, after studying the verses that traditionalists claim support eternal conscious torment, I have found that not only do none of them support eternal conscious torment, okay, that part I could see, but he went on to say most of them actually support conditional immortality. And I thought, Chris, it's better not to overstate your case. That looks bad. <laughs> and, uh, you know, even if you're right about the view, you don't want to, you know, exaggerate the, ev the, the, the evidence. But after, after years of... Uh, my own study on this topic and many discussions, debates, books, articles, and blog posts, I've become convinced that Chris was, was right. Now, what I'm going to do, because we have limited time, is I'm going to pick two of the most commonly quoted traditionalist proof texts to illustrate this point. I wish I had time to go through every single one of them. I, I really do. Um, we would, <laughs> hey, if after the conference you want to stay here till 2 in the morning... But, uh, but let's look at these two, uh, Matthew 25, 46, uh, and Mark 9, 47 through 48. And uh, uh, Mark 9, I know at least has already been mentioned this, this evening. Matthew 25, 46, and these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Now remember, for a long time, I believed in eternal torment. I get it. I understand how somebody can easily see this verse, see that word, that phrase, eternal punishment, and immediately imagine people in torment forever. And if they were in torment forever, that would be a type of eternal punishment and come to the conclusion that the Bible teaches eternal torment. I get it. But let's look at the verse and ask uh, two questions I want to ask about the verse. Question one, is it possible and reasonable that the phrase eternal punishment refers to a permanent and complete death sentence, that's what we mean by annihilation, rather than to eternal torment? So we're not asking whether it's true or not yet, we're just asking, is it reasonable and possible that it could be talking about annihilation? And then the second question will be, is there anything in the verse which not only allows, but actually favors the conditional immortality interpretation? So here's the first question. Is it possible that eternal punishment is referring to annihilation? So to answer this question, I want to, want to look at some other verses that talk about eternal things. Like Hebrews 6.2 talks about eternal judgment. Now, here's the thing. The Bible also talks about the day of judgment. And I don't think any Christians with any views think that the day of judgment is going to involve a process of judging that goes on and on for trillions and trillions of years forever. The, 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 the day of judgment actually lasts forever. I don't think anyone thinks that. So, eternal judgment does not refer to a process of judging that goes on and on forever, but rather to a judgment that, once given, is permanent and lasts forever. So in other words, 
if, if we have a neighbor and we tried to win them to the Lord, I hope you tried, and, and, and tried to share the gospel with them, you tried to invite them to church, you prayed for them, they rejected all that, they died, it's judgment day, God sends them to hell, and they get born up to ashes, or if you believe that they're tormented forever. Either way, the point is, it's an eternal judgment. A billion years later, God is not going to say, I changed my mind, come have eternal life, in the new heavens and new earth. The judgment never ever will change. Now, the uh, Bible also talks about eternal redemption. He, talking about Jesus, this is really good news. He entered once for all into the holy places, not by means of the blood of goats and calves, but by means of his own blood. And you know what we agree with uh, among the different views tonight is far more important than where we disagree. And we all agree that in an act of utterly amazing love, Jesus died for our sins. Thus securing an eternal redemption. But it was a once for all act. Eternal redemption does not refer to a process of redeeming that goes on and on forever, but rather to a once for all redemption that once given is permanent and lasts forever. So now, uh, on Judgment Day, even though I've sinned and you've sinned, your sins have been washed away by the blood of the Lamb. Your robes are white because they've been washed. You believed in Jesus. You've been forgiven. Now God invites you into his eternal kingdom. You have eternal life. Praise God that a trillion years later, he's not going to say, you know, I'm sorry, but the blood of Jesus is kind of worn out, and I'm going to just throw you into hell now. That's not going to happen, because it is an eternal redemption. The results of the redemption are eternal, not the process of being redeemed. Same thing is true for an eternal sin. It does not refer to a process of blaspheming the Holy Spirit that takes forever and ever to do, uh, but rather to a sin that once committed has permanent consequences and will never be forgiven. So back to Matthew 25, 46, it seems reasonable to me that the phrase eternal punishment might not refer to a process of punishing that goes on and on forever. Rather, it could at least possibly refer to a punishment that once completed is permanent and never reversed. In other words, it could refer to annihilationism. Now, this hasn't shown that the verse supports annihilationism yet, just that it seems like it's a possibility. So we've, 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 we've looked at the first question, oh, uh, this is a little way to remember this. This isn't proof that this view is correct, it just helps you to remember it. It is not an eternal punishing, it is an eternal punishment. Annihilation is an eternal punishment for the simple reason that it lasts forever. So the answer to question number one is yes, it is possible that the phrase eternal punishment could refer to annihilation. But is there anything in the verse which not only allows but actually favors the conditional immortality view? Let's, let's, let's look at the other part of the verse which is often ignored. The righteous into eternal life. The righteous will go into eternal life. Do you see the condition in the immortality? Who's going to live forever? Only the people who are among the righteous. Only the people who are among the righteous. Immortality, that's eternal life. And the condition is being among the righteous. There is only one punishment. Think about this. There is only one punishment that lasts forever, but which does not require living forever. That punishment is annihilation. This verse teaches conditional immortality and annihilationism. So for me, so, so, so the answer is yes. And, and so for me, what happened is Matthew 25, 46, it's not just that it got taken off the, so, the traditional side of the scales. For me, it actually moved over and added more evidence to the conditional immortality side. Now let's look at uh, Mark 9, 47 through 48. 
Jesus said, and if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out. Uh, it is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than with two eyes to be thrown into hell, where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. So Jesus is making a point here that all of us with all of our different views can agree with. And the point is this. If something is causing you to sin, get rid of it. If, 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 if you're watching uh, R-rated movies or other things you shouldn't watch, if they're causing you to sin, get rid of it or anything else in your life that's causing you to sin. But now let's look at how this verse uh, speaks to us about the nature of God's wrath and judgment. Um, I used to think, I clearly remember that I thought this way, I used to think that God will use worms and fire to torment the unsaved in hell forever. And I remember thinking, I'm not sure which is worse, having worms eat you forever and ever, or having fire burn you forever and ever. Now, I did think it could be symbolic, but I thought, if it is symbolic, it must be symbolic of something really, really terrible to use that imagery. But aren't worms and fire precisely the way that dead bodies are either turned into dust or turned into ashes all around the world? There are exceptions, but are not the vast majority of human dead bodies either turned into dust by worms or turned into ashes by fire? And doesn't the Bible say that the unrighteous, the ungodly will be turned into ashes? And didn't God warn that the consequences of eating the fruit would be that you would turn back into dust? And then I found out, I didn't know this back when I was thinking about how terrible it would be for these worms to be eating people who were not saved. I didn't know that Jesus was quoting from the last verse of Isaiah. Here it is, Here it is the last verse of Isaiah. And they shall go out and look on the dead bodies of the men who have rebelled against me. God is speaking through Isaiah. And this is the part that Jesus quotes, basically word for word. For their worm shall not die, their fire shall not be quenched, and they shall be in abhorrence to all flesh. Now sometimes when I'm discussing this with someone, a brother or sister in Christ who holds the traditional view, I have a hard time getting them to see this. The worms in the fire are operating on dead bodies. There are no living people in this picture who are in pain because a worm is eating them or a fire is burning them. Dead bodies are in the picture, and dead bodies cannot be tormented. There's nothing in the context when Jesus quotes this verse that would lead someone to think that he was changing the way it was being used. Jesus could quote the Old Testament and change the way it was being used, but there's nothing to suggest he was doing that. Now, some people say, hold on. What about the fact that the worm will not die? What about the fact that the fire will not be quenched? Doesn't that mean that it's going on and on forever? And why would it go on for on forever unless the people were in torment forever? Well, this is a linguistic issue. The word not does not mean never. Not does not mean never in English, and not does not mean never in Greek, and not does not mean never in Hebrew. It just doesn't. So I think what Isaiah and later Jesus are saying is that here's the dead bodies of these enemies of God. He has slaughtered them. We don't want those dead bodies laying around forever in eternity. They're going to get torn to dust and ashes, and nothing can stop the process. Now, after the process is done, we don't really need the worms or this manifestation of fire, so they might end then, not because somebody went and killed them, but they just finished their job, possibly. That could be the case. So for me, Mark 9, 47 and 48, because it's talking about dead bodies, to me, that sounded more like annihilationism than it sounded like um, eternal torment. So um, the story of the uh, rich man in Nazareth, that's uh, in Luke chapter 16, 
that is one of the few verses that I feel like it just doesn't belong on the scales at all. And the reason has already been mentioned. <coughs> the, the conditional immortality view and the eternal torment view are about what will happen to unsaved people after the resurrection at the final judgment. But the story of the rich man in Nazareth, however you interpret it, is about the intermediate state, what happens to people um, in, in the story, what is happening to these people after they die, but before they are resurrected to judgment. And it does say that the rich man is in torment, but it does not say that the torment will continue forever. So for me, I just took that off the scales. Now, there are some other verses that might, I could see them as fitting with conditional immortality, but if I was trying to be neutral, I would say they're not that strong either way, so I'll take them off also. If I had time, I could show you why I believe all of these verses that are left, act, not only do they not support eternal torment, they actually support conditional immortality. So for me, they all moved over here. And this is what I was left with. And um, not only that, but when it came to trusted teachers, I now had some new trusted teachers um, who held to the conditional immortality view. Now, it doesn't mean I had gotten rid of the eternal torment trusted teachers. I don't agree with them on that one issue, but lots of people who believe in eternal torment still help me understand lots of the Bible. Uh, so I thank God for them. And the majority of my trusted teachers, or you could say the majority of church tradition, is still on the ECT side. So I leave that over there on the ECT side. But for me, it's just the, the rate of biblical evidence is just so much more that um, the fact that the majority of, 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 of trusted teachers believe in eternal torment is not enough for me to believe that anymore. This is why I'm now confident enough in the conditional immortality annihilation view of hell to spend time teaching it to others and defending it. Yet there is even more biblical evidence. There are theological themes that harmonize, I think, far better with annihilationism. The atonement. Jesus took our place when he, when, when he died for us. He suffered for a short time and then the main emphasis throughout the New Testament is that he died for us. To me, that sounds like he's taking the place of people who are going to die at the final judgment, annihilationism. And then there's uh, biblical justice. God is the one who gave us the standard, an eye for an eye. And throughout the Bible, God talks about paying people back according to their sins. And I know that not everyone's going to agree with this. I, when I look at that, I feel like annihilation is much more uh, fitting for um, proportional justice than people being in torment for trillions and trillions of years, and then more trillions and trillions forever uh, after committing sins in a lifetime of 70 or 80 years. Final harmony in Christ. The Bible paints a picture of a perfect world where everything is submitted to Christ and everything's in harmony, but if the eternal torment view were correct, there would be billions of enemies of God, people who hate God, existing for all of eternity. To me, that doesn't fit with some of the biblical imagery. God is good. This one is perhaps more subjective, but I think even looking at biblical standards of goodness it fits better with conditional immortality. And then finally, the issue of immortality itself and eternal life. Some people are surprised by this. The Bible nowhere from Genesis to Revelation says that all people will live forever. It nowhere says that everyone has a soul that is immortal. And it nowhere says that the ungodly will live forever. Um, the Bible is very consistent about this. And I've challenged lots of people to find me a verse that says that, and no one ever has. And, 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 and I haven't found any either. Uh, word studies. This will be getting near the end here. So uh, 
I, I love to do word studies, and I've dug into some of the words that the Bible uses to describe what will happen to unsaved people at the final judgment. The word apolemy is and, and, and a very closely related Greek word, apoleia, is the most common. Uh, it's used a lot of times in the New Testament, including John 3.16 and Matthew 10.28. Uh, it basically means perish. It was used by Greek authors before the New Testament, approximately during the time of the New Testament, after the New Testament, who wrote about the different possibilities of what would happen to human souls, and it was clearly, explicitly, plainly used to refer to annihilationism. A katakayo means to burn something up completely, not to singe it, not to, you know, it, it means to turn it into ashes and smoke. Um, and that's used to describe what will happen to the ungodly. Alethros means destruction. It was also used to refer to the annihilation of human souls after death. Aphanizo, I think only one time in the New Testament, Paul used it to talk about what would happen to people who scoffed at the gospel instead of accepting it. And it means to vanish away. And it's another word that was used by other Greek authors to refer to the annihilation of people after death. So all, all of this made me believe in conditional immortality. Heavenly Father, I pray that you will speak to us in our hearts and minds. Help people to process what they've heard and to think about it. God, we all want people to know your truth. And if I'm wrong, I want people to find that out. And I would appreciate it if someone could help me to see it. But if I'm right, I pray that you'll help them to see that. Even more importantly, God, we all agree on this. That whatever hell is, and, and, and um, this has already been pointed out, that whatever hell is, we do not want to go there, and we do not want our neighbors to go there. So help us to walk together in unity to do all we can with the power of the Holy Spirit to win people to Christ so that they will not experience your terrible, just wrath on the day of judgment. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Okay, I think we have time for some questions and answers. And um, uh, I am also going to pull up a different slide deck here because I actually have a slide deck for questions and answers because I have talked about this with a lot of people and often, uh, let's see, there we go. Okay, that's it. And, 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 and I often can guess what kind of questions people are going to ask. Okay, yeah. Uh, one one uh, word we want to give is try your best to get as close to the microphone as you can because uh, not only helps the room, but it helps online. It's very important. So if you need to raise it up, please do that. And also those of you online, you can go and we are getting some. So uh, we'll read those off here in a moment. Go ahead. Is it, hang on just one second. Wait, are the mics off? Okay. Uh, it's not seen. All right, there we go. Okay. Yeah, thanks for that talk. That was excellent. So my question is on Mark 9, 47 that you brought up during the talk. Yes. Um, so I, I double checked. Uh, the word for hell there is actually Gehenna. Yes. And so that to me kind of implies that the decomposition that's being talked about here is not physical, like, uh, happening currently, but is post-judgment. Uh, is that, I'm curious, uh, how do conditional, uh, conditionalists understand Gehenna? Is yes. it something that is post-judgment, and how does that integrate? Yeah, okay, so the question is, um, so Jesus says, uh, whatever you do, don't get thrown into hell, and the word he uses is Gehenna, and that is the final judgment. That is, that is not the intermediate state. That's the final judgment, Gehenna. And he's saying, well, if it says Gehenna, isn't that referring to something non-physical? Isn't that referring to something, some kind of spiritual decomposition? Is that? Yeah, this is the verse, right? Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. This is the verse where worms and fire are being talked about. And you said, well, isn't that how our bodies on earth get consumed? So perhaps that's the actual meaning of this verse is not what's happening post-judgment, yes. but it is actually about pre-judgment, just what happens to our earthly body. Uh, okay. If it's talking about Gehenna, it would seem to point the other way. 
Okay, so there is a, 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 there is a thing that is very popular in the culture, uh, even in Christian culture, which is that whether we're thinking about heaven or hell, people tend to think of it as like uh, something that's happening to like the spiritual ghostly part of us. Um, but that is not biblical. And, and, and this is not just a conditional immortality view. Um, I, I, um, the Bible, one of the, one of the things that is really basic to Christianity is belief in the resurrection of the dead. And of course, Jesus rose from the dead and he had a very physical body after he rose from the dead. He said, he said I'm not a ghost. He said, touch me, feel me, give me something to eat. And we also are going to have a physical resurrection. Uh, we are going to have physical bodies. Now, the Bible refers to a spiritual body. That does not mean a ghostly body. It doesn't say a spirit body. It says a spiritual body. Paul also says, uh, those of you who are spiritual should be the ones who help to restore people who have fallen into sin. He doesn't mean those of you who are ghostly. He means those of you whose lives are being controlled by the Holy Spirit. And so right now, my body causes me problems of different types. And one type of problem it causes me is that it has wrong desires. It, uh, the Holy Spirit wants me to get up and have my early morning prayer time, and my body wants to stay in bed. I believe that when Paul says that we will have a spiritual body, he means that our bodies will be in perfect harmony with the desires of God and the Holy Spirit. And I don't know if we'll sleep in, 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 in the new heaven and the new earth, but if we do, when it's time to get up, we'll want to get up. And uh, so, we'll, so, so it's nothing about being ghostly. So, so when you ask that question, you have to understand, I believe that the unrighteous are also going to be resurrected in very physical bodies, but not immortal bodies. And those very physical bodies will be destroyed. Now, Matthew 10, 28 says their soul will also be destroyed. And I don't know how God's going to do that. But as for the bodies, I happen to think that most likely, I don't know for sure if it's literal, but I think it could be that most, that those bodies will actually get consumed uh, and, and be torn to dust and ashes and that they will be physical bodies of unrighteous people. Does that? Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, my follow-up would be, is there any way that you understand the place of Gehenna? Is that just not, is it just uh, sort of a useful fiction? Or no. is, it or, seems like if you take the literal interpretation, Gehenna is a place where yes. the damned go, but as a I, conditionalist, clearly they don't go anywhere permanently, they're just gone. So there's actually would seem there's no Gehenna. Right, so I, so I do believe that Gehenna is a place. Um, I'm a little bit humble about the details um, I certainly think that it could be a literal location where the unrighteous people, um, either they'll be thrown there. Some of these details the Bible doesn't give, and, I, and so I just want to be humble about them. Um, sometimes I, I, it looks to me like the people are going to be thrown into Gehenna, and they're going to suffer there while they're dying, and then they'll die, and then they'll decompose. Other times I think they're going to be dead, and then the dead bodies get thrown into Canada. Either way, I think it is a place where the annihilation will happen. But, but eventually, all those dead bodies will be ashes and smoke. And, um, and, 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 and so I don't know what will happen to the place after that. Will it continue to smoke as kind of like a testimony to God's destruction of all evil? Maybe, uh, or maybe it will be, you know, turned into a garden and redeemed and something nice. I just don't know. Yeah, that was very helpful. Thanks for those answers. Okay, thanks. I, I do know that uh, if you pull it up on, like, Google Earth or something, Gehenna looks really nice in the fall. <laughs> <laughs> it is an actual place, you know, Valley Hill. Yes. But my question is, um, for me, I think that, you covered Matthew and Mark, but I think the Revelation 20 and, of course, Revelation 14, I think those are the two verses that most uh, eternal conscious torment, uh, that's where they go first and yes. then work their way backwards. So how would you, what is it about those two verses that make you not only think they don't belong on the ECT side of the scale, but what made you 
put them over to the other one because yes. you didn't get to those two verses. And those seem like the biggest ones to hang the ECT hat on. So, I, I'm, I'm glad you asked. So very briefly, explain Revelation for everybody. So, so <laughs> yeah, the, the answer won't be super brief. Um, I thought somebody would ask this, so I prepared some slides on it. Let's look at these two verses so we know what verses we're talking about. Uh, Revelation 14, 11, and the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever. And they have no rest day or night, these worshipers of the beast in its image, and whoever receives the mark of its name. I, I, can, I can understand why people think that's teaching eternal torment. Uh, Revelation 20.10, and the devil who had deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur, where the beast and the false prophet were, and they will be tormented day and night, forever and ever. Uh, the slides are not advancing. They're, they are on my computer, though. Uh, hold on a minute. It's my fault. No, I think it's, it should be advancing, I think. Let me try this. I, I don't know, let's see. Uh, you know what, I'm not going to uh, worry about it. Uh, it was there for a second. Yeah, uh, some, some, it was there for a second? Hold on a minute, I think I can get it up then. I think it's worth it to get it up. It'll only take a minute, or less, I hope. Okay, let's see, uh, so we have uh, two PowerPoint slide shows up, that's the problem. And, uh, okay. There we go. Okay, there we go. Revelation 14:11. And Revelation 20.10. Okay. Now, in the Bible, God sometimes gave people a vision of the future. Uh, we see this in Genesis, where um, the uh, Pharaoh has a, um, uh, a dream about the future. And in it, there were seven thin cows that eat seven fat cows. And it is a dream about the future. But in real life, there are no cannibalistic cows. The cows are symbolizing something. We see it later in the book of, in da of Daniel. God gives King Nebuchadnezzar a vision of the, of the future. There's a giant statue made of different types of metal, gold, uh, silver, and bronze, and iron mixed with clay. It is truly about the future, but in the future, there's not this physical statue. It's about kingdoms. So God often uses uh, symbols when he's giving people visions of the future. Now, in general, the book of Revelation consists of a vision given to John. This vision also uses symbols to reveal truths about the future and about God's plans. Some symbols are bizarre and shocking. There are seven-headed monsters in the vision. But no one thinks there's going to be a literal seven-headed monster on the earth. Even though the word uh, seven is literal, and the word headed is literal, and, 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 and you know, in the word dragon is literal, but they're describing things that John, he literally sees them in a vision, but they're not going to be literal things in the future on the planet earth or any other planet. Also, there's a woman standing on the moon in John's vision. But it's not about female astronauts. It's, these things are not literal scenes from the future. Now, sometimes we are told what a symbol means, and there is a very clear pattern of how that works. Revelation 5, 8, And when he had taken it, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb. Each one had a harp, and they were holding golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of God's people. This should motivate you to pray, pray more. But on the topic of Revelation, um, a symbol is seen in the vision. It's a bowl of incense. We are told what the real life meaning of the symbol is. It's prayer. Now, wouldn't it be crazy if you had a Christian friend who read this, and then he said, Revelation is telling me that prayer is actually burning incense. And then he went back to the book of Colossians, 
And where it says, be devoted to prayer, he says, God wants me to be devoted to burning incense. Thankfully, Christians don't do that. Um, here's another example. It was granted for her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure, for the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. The fine linen is a symbol seen in the vision, and the real life meaning of the symbol is that it's the righteous deeds done by the saints. They should motivate you to do good deeds. But also, when it comes to this topic, um, imagine if, if, if you had a Christian friend who said, finally, in the very last book of the Bible, I finally found out what it means to be righteous. It means to wear fine linen. And so in the rest of the Bible where I'm encouraged to live a righteous life, I know what it means. God wants me to put on some fine linen clothes. And I hope you don't interpret the Bible that way. Revelation 21, 8. But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their portion will be in the lake of fire, uh, the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, a symbol seen in the vision, which is the second death, the real life meaning of the symbol. Wouldn't it be crazy? But my brothers and sisters who do that are not crazy people. But in this light, it feels a little bit crazy to say, now I know what the Bible means by death. It means being born alive forever and ever in a lake of fire. And so when I read the wages of sin is death, now I know what it means finally because I got to the book of Revelation. It told me it's backwards. It's, not, it's, it's, it's telling us that the lake of fire in the vision is a symbol of dying a second time. So the conclusion, the lake of fire is a symbol for dying a second time. And this fits with annihilationism and it's not fit with eternal torment. Way more depth is available on this. I have a video, What is the Lake of Fire? And on my blog post, which has the crazy name Paresiazomai, nobody will ever remember that. It's a cool Greek word that means to speak clearly and openly without being influenced by the fear of people. But you still won't remember it. Hopefully you can find it anyways by looking up my name. I have a seven-part blog, blog post, What is the Second Death? And I give a lot of detailed support to, to this argument. Um, also, RethinkingHell.com has great material on Revelation 20. I want to go quickly through Revelation 14. There are two descriptions of judgment in the second half of Revelation 14. I was going to... I don't want to take time going through all the details. Let me give you the uh, conclusion here. Here we go. We're getting to the conclusion. Okay. In uh, Revelation 14, near the end of Revelation 14, there's a giant sea of blood. Uh, and many evangelical commentators, not just people who believe in conditional immortality, say it's a hyperbolic metaphor. And one of the reasons is some people have actually calculated how many people blood this would be, because it gives the dimensions of the sea, or at least one of the dimensions, and you can, then you have to assume what the shape of the sea is. And it turns out, by a conservative estimate, assuming short horses, because the sea goes up to the bridle of the horse, in a skinny sea, you would need 720 billion people's blood. I don't think the point of Revelation is that God is literally going to squish the blood out of 720 billion people and make a giant sea. And neither do most evangelical commentators. Uh, Beale doesn't think that's what it means. He thinks it's hyperbole. Uh, David on in a very uh, respected evangelical commentary, the word biblical commentary, he thinks it's hyperbole. Uh, and uh, Mounts, one of the top Evangelical commentary thinks it's a hyperbolic metaphor. So, here's my point. Um, looking at this whole passage. In this passage, there's a cup of wrath. But the cup is a symbol. And you can look in the Old Testament and find the symbol. 
And in this passage of Revelation 14, there are uh, giant angels harvesting the earth. But the harvest is a symbol. Uh, there's not going to be a literal giant sickle harvesting people from the earth. The wine press is a symbol. And all of these symbols are found in the Old Testament. The, and then they show up again in the book of Revelation. God doesn't have a giant literal wine press where he's going to squish the blood out of people. Uh, and then uh, there's the giant sea of blood. And, and, and a lot of people, including myself, think that is also a symbol. So isn't it at least possible that the smoke of torment rising forever could be a symbol? I, I think we should say it's at least possible that it's a, the same type of symbol as the big sea of blood, that it is a, a, a metaphor, a symbol that also uses hyperbole like uh, a, a boxer saying, I'm going to wipe the floor with your face. You know, it's that kind of language, and it's not meant to be interpreted literally. And then um, the other symbols have been used previously in the Bible. How about smoke rising forever? Yes, Isaiah 34, and the streams of Edom shall be turned into pitch, and her soil into sulfur, her land shall become burning pitch. Night and day it shall not be quenched. Its smoke shall go up forever. Edom was destroyed. If you go to the Middle East today, you will not find smoke rising forever in Edom. It was a symbolic way of saying they're destroyed and they're not coming back. That's a long answer. Sorry. And I shortened it. Yeah. Uh, first of all, before I get to my question, I have to say, if you've never prayed using incense before, like it talks about in Revelation, it is cool. It is even cooler than fog machines. I'll say that, as cool as they are. Anyway, no. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah, totally. Um, so one of the things uh, I, I'm curious about is in this journey that you've had, uh, how much did it affect your understanding of heaven? And of heaven. Of heaven. And, like, what it looks like for us to be with Christ forever. Uh, I just, I'd love to hear about that. So um, I, I, I don't know that it had a big effect. Uh, I do believe that, okay, so I believe that heaven is going to be the new heavens and the new earth. I believe that uh, there's going to be a physical earth. I think a good way to start to imagine heaven, and I think it's, a, it's good to imagine heaven, but to do it humbly because we don't know the details, is to imagine this earth with nothing bad, but everything good. Imagine no mosquitoes, no COVID, no criminals, no death, nobody being mean, nobody hating one another, no terrorists, nobody dies, everybody lives forever, and every meal you eat is delicious. Just thought there. Uh, it is going to be physical. Now, is that the very best part of heaven? I think the very best part is going to be when we gather together and worship Jesus. Uh, that's, you know, but I think the other parts are going to be great too. Uh, so I don't, but, but to be honest, I think I would have held that view of heaven even if I never changed my view of hell. Uh, for some people, viewing hell as a more physical thing, like the Kahana question, might go along with viewing heaven as a more physical place. I do believe heaven will be a, a, a physical place, physical bodies, food to eat, people to talk to, that kind of thing. I have a more philosophical question. If the punishment uh, for the unsaved is the, to cease to exist, yes. then how is this any different? Does, doesn't it then logically show that it's the same punishment that everyone that God never created also faces. So except for it's even worse for them since they never even had the opportunity for eternal life. So in other words, the punishment is the same. God effectively then punishes an infinite number of people. Okay, so um, I wouldn't compare the experience of people who God did create and exist to people who don't, who never existed. Uh, I, just, I wouldn't think that way. But this goes into a category of questions, which is, is 
annihilation bad enough uh, to be a serious punishment? And the first thing you have to do is you have to think about, according to the conditional immortality view, what are the two options on Judgment Day? Because if the two options will be annihilated or be in eternal torment, of course annihilation would not seem like, you know, it would be like, let's pick annihilation, okay? I think most people would. Um, but those are not going to be the two options. The two options are going to be annihilation or eternal life in a world of pure, unalloyed joy and peace forever and ever with people you love. And the Bible indicates it's not going to be pleasant. We who believe in annihilation do not believe that the judgment is going to be a poof or it's going to be pleasant. There is going to be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Um, I think that probably refers to anger and sadness. But um, also annihilationism allows for any amount of temporary suffering uh, prior to perishing. So think of it this way. Everybody gets a death sentence, but can some people say, well, Hitler shouldn't be treated the same way as the old lady down the street who gave me brownies but didn't believe in Jesus? Okay, I agree. Annihilation doesn't, uh, annihilationism doesn't say they will be treated the same. Imagine they both get a death sentence, but one of them gets death by crucifixion and one by lethal injection. Now, that's just a way to imagine it. I don't know if that's exactly how it will be. And so, so there can be suffering in the process of being annihilated. And I don't know how much suffering there'll need to be. The Bible doesn't give a lot of details. If there needs to be a whole lot for justice, I guess there'll be a whole lot. But the Bible focuses on death, not on torment. Go ahead. Right, right, right. So to, to clarify, though, the punishment is death, right? Yes, the punishment is death. And, and it seems to me that almost all the verses that you reference have to do with death and destruction. So that's yes. the ceasing to exist. Yes. So the idea that there is some sort of temporary punishment that leads up to that ultimate death doesn't really seem to be as much a part of your biblical argument. I, I, I agree. The Bible puts a lot of emphasis on death, but there are some hints of, of, of limited suffering. For instance, Jesus says that... Uh, uh, those of you who, who knew God's will and sinned, uh, people who, like that should get a lot of, of, of uh, beatings, and people who didn't know God's will but sinned would only get a few. So t Now, I don't even know if that's talking about at the final judgment, but, but it does, to me, it implies the possibility that while death definitely is the emphasis, if you want one word, what is the penalty for sin? Well, death. I mean, that's the word Romans 6.23 uses, and... Um, so, so I agree with you that that's the Bible emphasis. But remember, the process of dying often involves suffering. It did for Jesus. So I don't see why it shouldn't involve suffering for those who rejected Jesus. Does that make sense? Yes, it just seems to me that the fate of those that didn't exist and the fate of those that are unsaved is the same. There's, there's not a significant difference. Well, yeah, yeah, but the people who didn't exist, they're not going to be facing God at Judgment Day with all of their sins exposed. Judgment is going to be a terrible experience for the unsaved. Yes. Uh, hi, Mark. Uh, good to meet you in person and great presentation. I'm just wondering if you think as um, conditionalists, annihilationists, are we gaining ground at all? Are we gaining influence? Obviously, we're in the minority here, but are we gaining influence at all? Okay, so the question is... Uh, is conditional immortality uh, spreading? Uh, are more people believing it? So I don't have statistics. Uh, I think that I've heard many people say that they think conditional immortality is spreading. I think it's spreading, but I can't prove that to you. But I think the view is spreading among, um, among evangelicals especially, which is what I most care about. I think the, the, I think the view is... So I have... Um, I don't have hard data, but that's my feeling, and it's not just my feeling. Chris, do you have anything to add? No. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's being discussed everywhere. You can't go to a theology Facebook group unless they forbid the topic, which some do. Uh, any, if it's not forbidden, then everybody's talking about it everywhere. Yes. All right, there's a couple from online. Um, one just says this, just asking for a bit of clarification. 
Does the most prominent form of eternal conscious torment propose that the unsaved will be resurrected into physical bodies and then sent to hell, or is it just their souls? So, I don't know, at the popular level, a lot of people, like, like a lot of people imagine that heaven is going to be souls floating around. Uh, but evangelical scholars know that, we know that people are going to be resurrected physical bodies. I think the true, same thing is true for final judgment for the unsaved. I can't tell you what the most popular view is at the popular level, but among Bible teachers, pastors, uh, scholars, I think the, the, the most popular view, and clearly the biblical view, is that the, uh, the unsaved will be resurrected to judgment. The Bible clearly states that the unsaved will be resurrected to judgment. Okay, and there's one on, on Scripture. Uh, how do you understand eternal destruction in 2 Thessalonians 1.9? Yes, eternal destruction, 2 Th Thessalonians 1.9. Let me see if I can quickly navigate to my slides on this. I don't. If I can't, then I'll just answer off the top of my head. Okay, yeah, I think I can. Okay, let's, uh, because I think this will help a little bit to look at this one. Here we go. Okay, I think I have 2 Thessalonians 1 9. Up here I do. Eternal destruction. Slide 103. Here we go. Okay. We, so you think I, I, I prepared all these slides just for tonight? Actually, uh, uh, these, these are pretty much the same slides that Chris and I used uh, for a debate that we had. Um, okay, here we go. 2 Thessalonians 1.9. They will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might. Now, I, I, I always thought from the very beginning, just a, a, a surface reading of this verse to me, it sounded like annihilation, not like eternal torment. But some people think eternal destruction sounds like eternal torment. And uh, I think that this verse actually supports annihilationism. Let's see why. Eternal destruction. Um, there's nothing about torment or conscious punishment in this verse. It just doesn't use the word torment. In Greek, destruction is alethros. Alethros is a Greek word used for annihilation. Um, I'm not saying that's the only thing it was used for. Uh, I think I have a quote here. Ah, from Plato. Now let me make something clear. I do not agree with Plato's beliefs. That's not why I'm quoting him. This is linguistic data to tell us how a Greek used the word alethros. And Sebes, I believed, granted that the soul is more lasting than the body, but said that no one could know that the soul, after wearing out many bodies, did not at last perish, Apollo me, itself upon leaving the body, and that this was the death, the destruction, a lethros of the soul, since the body is continually being destroyed. Now, if, especially if you read the whole context, it's very clear Plato is arguing against, uh, he, he, Plato believed in unconditional immortality. He believed that all human souls were automatically immortal all the time. He was arguing against the ideal that some human souls would cease to exist and one of the words he used to describe human souls ceasing to exist forever was alethros. So in other words, if, if, if he was writing in English, he could have put annihilation in there for alethros. What about this away from? Some people say, uh, oh, look, uh, this means that it's really talking about separation in the verse. Well, uh, we don't care where the annihilation occurs, whether it's close to God or far away from him. Some translations have just from, and this may refer to annihilation coming from God's presence, uh, that there's the fiery wrath of God coming from God is what destroys them. There's reasons to prefer this translation, but that's a technical discussion we don't have time for. Instead of focusing on where the annihilation takes place, we should ask when the annihilation takes place, when he comes on that day, eternal destruction that happens on that day, to me, that cannot fit eternal torment because you can't torment someone on a day, even if it's not a literal 24-hour day, if it's any limited period of time, it cannot be referring to eternal torment, but it fits annihilation perfectly. On that day, on judgment day, 
they are destroyed forever and they stay gone forever. But it happens on Judgment Day. Okay. Okay, so this is a great one to close with, and I think everybody should give this one some thought before we go. This came in earlier. I'm new to the re rethinking uh, the idea of hell, and sometimes I think maybe I'm wrong, and I'm going to end up in hell. Did you ever struggle with this? How did you get past the fear and get to peace? Okay, um, so the person is, um, I, okay, I'm, I'm going to assume, I think, that the person is a Christian, but they're afraid that they might, maybe they're not a Christian, maybe they're not saved. And um, uh, have I ever had doubts like that seep into my mind? I, that, I, the answer is yes, I, I have had doubts like that seep into my mind. Um, I think many Christians do. I mean, we've, we've, we've prayed and we've been baptized and we go to church and we try to live for Jesus, but we also, I, if you're like me, you are also very aware that you still sin, you blow it, and you fall short of the glory of God. And, um, and so this can, the, whether it's from our own flesh or the devil, it causes us to doubt God's promises. And I think that the, the solution to this is to go back to God's promises. Uh, like in First John, that whoever confesses his sin, God is faithful and just to forgive us from all of our sins and to uh, cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So we remember God's promises. And then I remember how great my sin is, but I also remember how great my Savior is. And I remember that Jesus, that, the, that, that what's saving me from, from my sin is not my effort at getting over my sinful habits or things like that. That's a good effort. Everybody should be doing that, but that's not the basis of my salvation. It's Jesus, the blood of Jesus. And then I ask a different question to myself. Is the blood of Jesus enough? I hope, I hope your answer to that is yes. The blood of Jesus is enough for your sin, no matter how bad your sin is. And then sometimes people think, well, what about that time Jesus said there's a sin that will not be forgiven? Here's my opinion. If you are worrying about it, you haven't committed it. The people, the people who Jesus said that to, they were not worrying that maybe they were not Christians. They were plotting how to kill Jesus. Now, if Jesus isn't here, but if you, if you were plotting how to kill Jesus and you saw Jesus do mighty miracles right in front of your eyes and you said, nope, I think the devil did that through you, and then you went to plot to kill him, I would say at least maybe you had committed that sin. But let's say that you've done other really bad things. Let's say that 10 years ago, you were persecuting Christians, throwing them into prison and killing them if they didn't renounce Christ. You could still be forgiven because that's the Apostle Paul who was forgiven for those sins. You have not committed the unforgivable sin. God's grace is enough. It was, I believe, John Newton who said, uh, uh, it's a quote from a movie, but I do believe it's a true quote. He said, I'm old, but I remember two things. I'm a great sinner, and I have a great Savior. So I pray that that will give you peace. Amen. Thank you, Mark. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Good job.